The best way to learn how to make a film in a shortest period of time is hopping on set. In this video, I'm gonna be navigating you behind the process of how we shot our feature film, Sway, in one week. Here's where we have all the camera gear. And all the camera gear is galore. Action, come towards us. Okay, cut. One second. Day one, everyone's finding Settle. a pace, whether you are a seasoned filmmaker like our cinematographer, Chris Moresby, or our film students, or being Charlie and I, who are the directors of the project, kind of sitting in the middle of being <laughs> pro and completely novice. Everyone sort of figures out their pacing by the end of day one. The quickest way to make a shot look cinematic all the time is adding atmosphere or fog or haze. But a golden rule for making films is once you do it once, you gotta do it over and over and over again. Whether it's moving a piece of production design, so if you're moving a chair into one shot, that chair has to stay there forever. If a character takes a bite out of their sandwich in the one take, they gotta keep taking bites out of the sandwiches. This was one of the biggest pains of the asses of the project because you'd always forget to do it. We'd always be delayed by having to put fog in every single scene, but overall, Hey Kenji, that ballast out there has to move. We have the uh, Ari Alexa 35. We're using the Ingenue zoom lenses. I want to do a lot of optical zooms on this project, which we were able to achieve. It's also nicer to have zoom lenses because as you know, prime lenses, you're stuck at one focal length and when you're shooting under a time frame, being able to zoom in and capture a second focal length without having to do a lens swap becomes increasingly more time efficient when time is compounded in the span of a week. Which comes in, it's gonna be the same walk out. Oh right, and she looks over her shoulder. Yes, so we're gonna do yeah. the same pull. He, he apologizes. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Charlie Hamilton, the other director on the project. Charlie and I co-directed this project together, which directing and just working on set is a collaborative process. I will talk more about co-directing in another video. My name is Zach Ramlin, and I co-direct this project. But overall, making a movie is incredibly confusing. So multiplying yourself by two becomes way better and way easier. And if you have other collaborators who you trust, or you can split your brain in half without ego or any sort of you know, wrinkles in the sheets, if that makes sense. Yeah, nice and soft, so. Yeah, start off on this one, and if we could, if we could hide another camera maybe in here. This off. would be de a definite, so either we get a B camera in here. It's like, yeah, he's gonna be like right here. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh yeah, that's good, that's fun. Yeah. Vegging, yeah. vegging, yeah, for sure. Okay, quick reset. Sway, hop out of frame. Come back to one. That was great. That was perfect. Let's do you one more really quick. Uh, I just want to know because Carter will clearly be in the shot here. I like landing on it. In this section, I'm gonna talk about scene coverage, how to execute a scene and how we did this. Because this movie plays out with characters being in an uh, interview, what the best way to shoot this was actually to shoot one person's coverage for multiple scenes and then swap over and shoot the other person's coverage for multiple scenes. Now, one of the questions that I had before we hopped on set was, why don't we just shoot A camera this way, B camera this way, and then a C camera as a wide, capturing basically all the angles that we need? The answer was lighting. If you shoot one person's coverage, they're gonna have a completely different lighting setup as another person's coverage. So what we had to make sure was that the lighting was consistent and we had the most dialed in coverage on one person's uh, angle. So what we did was we did scene one, one actor, shot them out, then shot scene two, the same actor, changed the camera positioning so it felt a little different, banged out all their coverage, and then swapped the angle and started from scene one again, which is why this process became so confusing. Fortunately, we were working with incredibly talented actors who were able to bring themselves into the scenes a lot easier, and because one actor kind of got the step up of rehearsing all of their bits out before they were actually on camera, they were able to execute the scene way better because they just had a ton of off-screen time to rehearse their dialogue. I think I think we might want to wide for the scene. Like it's tight the whole time. Uh, I know, but like, you know how much time it's gonna to take to get a wide? <laughs> Forever. And, okay. for, and for what? For cool. one okay. Shot the big thing you should know about scene coverage is that wide angles are 
bullshit. Why? If you're to think of it as percentages, you'll see a wide shot in a scene most of the time, 10% of the scene or 20% of the scene. The vast majority of a dialogue scene, conversation scene is tight. It's mediums, it's close-ups. Watch a movie, it's mostly close-ups. They're fast and more efficient and carry more emotion. But when you do wide shots, you have to like clear out the whole set, clear out the other camera, clear out everybody, all for one shot that lasts so little time. So while they are probably some of the most important shots in films, they are the biggest pains in the ass. So these are mediums? You can take it as far as you have one. We're talking about uh, camera blocking here and uh, actor blocking, how to shift it up in this space because a lot of this film is an interview. We wanted to change the character's blocking so that it became a little bit more visually interesting. This is a lot of sitting, so when you're talking about Parkwood, yeah. Park might feel good if you go to the window. Exactly. Parkwood's 21 blocks. So we're finding a point in the script where we can get Emmanuel, our main character, to walk up to the window and look out while they're delivering their dialogue. And when you do this, you have to then relay that to the cinematographer and to the production designers to make sure that everyone knows that this is what will be seen on the bit. And then what we're, we're going to kind of skip all this when we're going to come back. He's going to come by the window, but what we're going to do is just shoot out the setting stuff. So basically what's going to happen is we're going to come back because we're going to get special. Yeah, let's solve that problem with the box for this yeah. one. The sheer amount of talent on this project was probably represented best in seeing how many people were on yeah. set. Yes, yeah, It's actually so ridiculous. Like over to our right, it is dead calm. And then over behind me is like 500 people. It's actually insane how many people are cooped up in a space. So I was shooting on the Alexa LT, I think, and we had our cinematographer shooting on the Alexa 35, which is Ari's new camera. Both cameras cut together pretty well, but I also shot on a third camera, which is FX3. So for a lot of our dialogue scenes, to make sure we were capturing as much as we possibly could, we would shoot on three cameras. And these three cameras, while all being different, they actually cut together pretty well. So A camera has kind of all the pressure weighted on it because it's A cam, it's the main camera, it's the most beautiful shot. Then B camera, has a little less pressure, so that was the camera I was operating. Having the luxury of being an unimportant camera kind of gives you the flexibility to just tinker and play with some stuff. Hey, wait, pause. Uh, the lamp is out in the corner here. You might be watching this video and being like, wow, what are these beautiful tracks playing behind Zach's beautiful voice? I'm glad you asked that because that means you think I have a beautiful voice. But the second thing is you probably like the music. So do I. And it's from the platform Track Club. Track Club was our music that we used as temp and also in inspiration score for our film because of its versatility. Not only does Track Club have thousands of tracks available for artists and filmmakers to use, but it also has this beautiful little feature called Mix Lab, which is my favorite button on the platform. I don't know why more sound websites don't use this, but if you find the track that you like, or it's almost there, you can make it exactly what you want by clicking on the Mix Lab and choosing through their selection of highlighting certain instruments, not just certain instruments, all of the instruments, all of the tracks. And if you're still like, mm, I just wish it was faster or I just wish it was slower. Or you can also get the score to fit the rhythm of the scene by changing your BPM. And you have unlimited download tracks so you can get whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want it, play it into your film. And if it doesn't fit, you can go back to that mix lab preset that you're using and just grab another instrument or just grab all the instruments and layer it in. Music is one of the best ways to elevate a scene as we all know that, but stems. It stems that does the magic for you. So I'd highly recommend taking a look at Track Club and all the beautiful music that they have in it. Not only is it for dramatic, cinematic stuff, but also talk to camera videos like this. I personally don't like having complicated music in my talk to camera videos. Rather, just a simple drum track or something with like a little bit of a bass hit, and it feels really good. The best music starts with a good music platform. I highly recommend taking a look at Track Club. You can hit a link in the description below to take a look at it. So with that said, let's get some Track Club music playing and hop back in to the behind the scenes. This set compared to our short film that we shot last year is tremendously different. So with that set, we had a think, total of 10 crew in a much bigger space. And with this set, we have a total of like 15 to 20 people in a smaller space. Every day, we had to set up and reset the set. So the homeowner, whose house we were shooting in, could go and relax and live in his house. And then every day, We'd have to hop on set and basically do like a re-renovation where we make it look like our film set. Two hours every day, just set resetting. I can go dark 
but scene, not. Scene 15, we go dark. darker. And how do we go from like the stages? If we go really dark, it's like, oh, the sun went down or something, you know? I think it's a movie. Because there's going to be these guys outside. These lights are always going to be there. I'm never going to change that. Yeah. I think there's a lot side. of negative film yeah, on this, this side. Yeah, this side. So we just keep adding more and more. And that I did, should help. Especially if we're shooting this way, I would love to see the city more. So if we have to mm -hmm. expose for outside a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we could change the way we're doing. Like, you know, we did those overs and stuff. Maybe we do more ins, like pushing in yeah, as we're going. Our cinematographer, Chris, was concerned, as all cinematographers are, about lighting consistency. So day one, we had a beautiful sunny day. Day two, we had overcast. Day three, it was raining and hailing. Day four, it was super sunny out. Day five, it was sunny out. And day six was like overcast again. So when you make a movie that's shooting all at windows, looking outside all the time, the biggest concern is lighting consistency. Sometimes there's just some things you can't control. Weather is, is something you can't. A way to talk about cinematographer-director relationship in a film is the cinematographer is helping with the technical and creative. The director is just sort of pitching ideas to try and execute the overall tone um, of get, the project. Yeah, it gets ways later. That gives him a little time to maybe like figure out the scene with Michelle. Yeah, yeah. Leo comes in. Uh, talk right now. So he comes in and joins him, and that's that way. Yeah. The fun part will be Lisa will be here. She'll kind of look over as he comes in. So yeah. it doesn't have to be a super wide. If you do. Oh yeah, no, no, no. This could be done on a 55, or, or sorry, a 50 or a 35. Yeah. Emmanuel gets up, follows him, and they're going to go down that pathway. And then Emmanuel leaves. I kind of go to see the two of them, but then I drop back to her, and then we go. Love yeah. it. Over here. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Love it. So how far this way are we going to see? As far as we can get. <laughs> I know. So, so, so not fire. Yeah. At yeah. the beginning of every day, and probably at the end of every day, and mostly in between, the process of the director, producer, and the head creatives is to problem solve. So there's going to be a series of problems, not necessarily unforeseen ones, mostly predictable ones, where you'll have to figure out how are we going to execute this in the best amount of time. So Charlie and I are talking about okay, we have the camera set up as a wide, we're gonna have to reset the whole set, make it look good, so how many shots can we bang out from this angle that feel different so we can use them later? As much as we can, this should be our 180 because then everyone's silhouette, we're shooting shadow side, and it just will give more depth. When we shoot this way... So scene coverage is always based off of a 180 rule with the odd exception of breaking the 180. So 180 would mean you're shooting from one angle of a scene, so actor A is looking left to right, and actor B is looking right to left so that it looks like they're looking at each other, creating this illusion of a conversation. As soon as you break that and let's say actor is looking left to right and the other actor is looking left to right, they're looking from the same direction, which then becomes jarring. Not impossible, but jarring. So to keep the flow of a scene, to make sure it feels good, you're always keeping the camera and lighting on a certain side of the actor. So therefore, one, it's actually efficiently easier, but two, it keeps a consistency within how the scene we just, plays out. It's just for th two seconds. Perfect. Yeah, why don't she goes on her phone or something? Like when they leave, yeah. she kind of like starts doing something. Pulls out her phone. Little sus. Yeah, a little sus. The key is not to overcomplicate something that doesn't need to be complicated. Now, if you're working under a million dollars, you're going to have to make creative sacrifices in order to serve the story. The biggest thing to know is sacrifices are never visible. All you see is actually the curated image that makes it on to the big screen. So really, make as many sacrifices as you need to. Um, Sayla, we'll have our coffee cups for this scene. Okay, sweet. You have 12, all right, we'll find one. It'd be great if his block, you know what? Since he was like upright for a lot of it, he should. He starts leaning in. Yeah, I like this man, especially well, when tight, he, leaning Once he in. leans in, then we fucking right yeah. here, and then it's, it's a just great like, walking. And uh, teleprompter. Yeah. Yeah. So. Especially now that he's getting defeated, we can kind of tell that with his demeanor. Yeah. And then I don't know. She sits pretty upright throughout the whole thing. But She's I'm like super confident. So 13 is the longer scene. I think we should see his blocking shift in 13. That's not a bad part. Where is it, man? Is it getting processed? Yeah. You might be wondering, how do you make a movie with this amount of people, with this amount of energy? And 
the reality is a good script and a good story. Charlie Hamilton, one of the directors and writer of the project, crafted an incredible script that just created this snowball. We attached uh, the lead actor, Emmanuel, onto the project very early on. He was the one who actually reached out to be like, hey, let's make this movie. And with his excitement behind the project, all of a sudden this energy just started churning and everyone wanted to get involved. So within about a week, we had a co-director, which is myself, another producer, and then in two weeks, we had about three producers and a crew involved. And by week three, we were into pre-production, getting ready for production. And by week four, we were filming the movie. Yeah. But yeah, if it's uh, if it's feeling a little too composed, I think like let's just like relax yeah. and start showing your darker side in this. I don't know. Do you want to do you want to do what we did yesterday? What? Uh, sh shoot out one direction of the day and shoot out the other direction of the day. Yeah, I think. I uh, think Time wise. I don't want to chime in, but it would save a lot of time. It would? Yeah. Okay, cool. Over, so they don't just wanted to run you through the blocking have, just because like, we're waiting for everyone else. So this is the scene where you walk in, you're like sway okay. with the phone. You come out through this door. Here. How do you direct actors? This is like one of the biggest things that I always struggled with because I didn't know, I'm more of a technical person. I understand editing, I understand color grading, cinematography, basically everything but performance. The best direction can actually just be more little nudges it's in the nuance versus over explaining. So just as, a, just as a note from Carter, Try not to jump on each other's uh, dialogue when, when, we're, when we're doing it on the phone. because Working you know, with actors like who have a bit more time behind the wheel, they really need only a few quick things said to them in order to completely change how they approach it. And if you're having trouble explaining your vision, try acting it out in your head and then ex figuring out the key details to which made that different from the take that maybe they did. And if you still don't understand how to convey that message, ask them how they're feeling about it and maybe just so you have it, get them to perform the scene differently than what they did in the prior take and see which one feels better. Okay, and this is just rehearsal. So Manny, we'll get you to deliver the line. It's safe. Uh, safe yeah. And action. Directing a film, you basically get like three tiers of questions. Easy, medium, and hard. The easy questions are just like, hey, what box, what type of photo would you like printed? And then the medium would be like, hey, what do you think of this style of performance for the scene? And then the hard would be, we don't have any time to shoot this scene. How can we change it last minute? Let's go. And my main note for directing anything is always have an answer. If we have B camera shooting that, we get A camera here, so we shoot it out with those two angles. Yeah, so we do one take of this of this uh, here. Yeah. Hopefully B cam's up by take two. Take two, we'll add a 135. No? It's okay. a third. even started, like, they haven't even started okay. dumping it yet, so it's going to take like an hour for like I have a love-hate relationship with big, expensive cameras, and you're about to hear them. Big, beautiful cameras look amazing. They have way more form and function on larger sets. But boy, oh boy, they have large-ass file sizes that take forever to transfer, which then delay the second camera or they're so big you can't fit them into a space and you usually need to have two operators just for them to function. We bought four eight terabyte hard drives that we filled up completely. Tw around 24 terabytes of footage on this movie. So that took a long time to transfer. So if you have the excitement to shoot on a big camera, just recognize that with big cameras come probably triple the responsibility on all facets of making the film. So while they look nice and they're really cool behind the scenes and they make the final picture really good, prepping your brain, do I have the capacity to multiply my time, effort, and energy by three or four to use this piece of equipment? Fortunately, we did, so we used them. We used double, <laughs> we used two RE cameras, which looked just insane just so much up here. Look, I would love to like either have it on the gimbal or have it on the steady cam, or we're just like moving around. Like this is like, could be a 360 set. So this is day two. We're taking a quick break from shooting scene 13 and 15. Been, uh, it's been an intense day. Um, uh, how's the day going? Going well. Going well. <laughs> If you follow some of the steps and lessons that brought up in this, I can guarantee your film will become a little bit smoother in the future. So love you guys so much. Thank you for watching. Bye.
Making a movie is fucking confusing. You're shooting like a scene here and then you're shooting the tail end of the next scene. And so for this, we're shooting someone's coverage all at once and then we're shooting someone else's coverage all at once for both scenes. The actors, it's, it's putting them through the ringer. You're not, we're not doing the scene right now. We're just doing your scene and then we're doing your scene. And then we're hip hopping over and yeah, it's pretty taxing, I think. Every time you make a film, you have no idea if it's even gonna cut together. You're just get the whole thing's a guessing game based off of intuition. And I think yeah. my, our intuition's good, but we also might be completely off. Most of my movies I thought were gonna be good and then just... Yeah, have you yeah. seen The Room? <laughs> that was my script. That was my, I, I wrote that.